now. So I think we'll start. Um, so welcome to um, the last session of today and the last Friday afternoon session of GCSE Biology um, as part of the My Tutor Online School. We are back next week, but only on Monday. Um, we'll talk more about that at the end of the lesson. Um, so today, well, let's pop this up. So today, um, as part of the GCSE biology that we've been working through, we're going to look at the eye. Um, it follows on from, um, if you're in the lesson on Monday, it follows on from uh, the subject of the nervous system and the brain. So talking about control in the body um, and linking that eventually back to homeostasis. So maintaining equilibrium in the body. Um, so this is going to be an hour long session. So until three o'clock talking about the eye. Um, we're following the AQA biology specification. Um, if you're not studying AQA, don't worry. This does occur on all of the other ones as well. So we've tried to keep it quite general. Um, so you'll still get something from this session, even if you're not studying AQA at school. My name's Charlotte. I have been the biology tutor throughout the My Tutor Online School sessions um, since we started lockdown. Um, I studied conservation and biodiversity as a master's degree at the University of Exeter. Um, and now I work for a charity that helps farmers um, make their farming practices more environmentally friendly, which is great. Uh, I've tutored over 150 lessons on my tutor. Um, and have been tutoring as part of the online school since the start. Okay, so um, let's move on to today's content. Just as a reminder, um, you can see at the bottom of the screen, you've got the chat and the Q&A buttons. Um, please do use both of those. Um, what I tried to say is that if you've got questions about the content, pop them in the question and answer, and then I can make sure I'll stop regularly throughout the session and um, answer those as, as I can. And the chat, um, keep that for kind of general comments, um, any answers to questions that I ask kind of during the session as well. Um, and that should keep that fairly clear and make sure that I don't miss any questions. Okay. So last time, we talked through reflex actions. So we talked through the different types of nerve, um, different types of neuron that are um, included in a relay um, in a reflex action. So there are three types of neuron. There's the sensory neuron, the relay neuron, and the motor neuron. And we said that the main difference between reflex action and the main um, kind of reactions that we've looked at is that a reflex action isn't conscious. So the relay neuron takes um, the message from the receptor through to the motor neuron through the spinal cord without involving the brain. So reflex actions are actions that we take without thinking about them. We only know that they've happened after they've happened. So things like blinking, digesting, a heart beating, all of those things are reflex actions. Um, we also talked about different parts of the brain um, and how we can study the brain. Um, so that kind of completed that bit of the puzzle as part of the nervous system, as we hadn't talked much about the brain and how messages are relayed in the brain. Today, we're going to talk about the eye and how the eye works and problems with the eye. And this kind of fits into the general picture because the eye is uh, the part of our body where we see things and seeing things is done through receptor cells which perceive any change in a stimulus. So linking this back to um, our couple of previous lessons, a stimulus or any change in our environment will trigger um, or be, be noticed by a receptor cell. And those receptor cells in our eyes detect changes in, in our image in what we see around us and then communicate that back to our brain. So this fits into the general picture because the eye has receptor cells into it. We're also going to talk about a couple of problems that you can have with eyes and then we are going to have a quiz at the end. 
Um, just having a look at the q and A, I I can see that a couple of people wondering what's going to happen next week. So next week, uh, some of you will be going back to school, which will be great. Some of you won't, that's fine. So as part of the uh, online school, we're reducing sessions a little bit, but we are going to continue to have one biology session each week. It'll be on Monday from two till three. So the same time as our um, Monday sessions are at the moment. Keep an eye on the online school um, a timetable and that will keep you fully up to date with that but hope to see most of you on Monday who can join as well and we'll be continuing on with what we've done. Okay so let's talk about the eye. So first of all I thought we'd have a look at the eye in general um, and how it's made up and talk a little bit about how important our eyes are to us. So for us, eyesight is our primary sense. We have really, really well-developed eyesight and it's what we use as humans um, or what we would have used to perceive threats. We rely very much on our eyes for that. So they're very highly developed. Um, and there's a few parts of the eye that you need to know about. Um, so let's start with the sclera over here. So the sclera you can see is this kind of yellowy strip here. It runs all around the eye and it protects it. It's a protective layer. Um, next round we have the retina and the retina is this layer. It's slightly pinky on this diagram but it's slightly difficult to see. Let me put the pointer on. Um, so you can see it at the back of the eye there. The retina runs all the way around the back of the eye and the retina is where those receptor cells that we talked about are. So receptor cells um, are sensitive to light intensity and to colour um, and they are included in the retina at the back of the eye. So that's where the image needs to get to or the um, light needs to get to in order for us to generate that image. Um, moving further around here, we have the ciliary muscle and the suspensory ligament. Both of those, as you can see, so we have ciliary muscle and suspensory ligaments at the top and the bottom of this lens. And this lens, oh, it's just hidden behind the lesson scheduler there. The purpose of the lens is to fine tune the focusing of those light rays that we talked about. So the lens is what um, bends those light rays to make sure that they hit the receptor cells on the retina at the back of the eye. We have the iris. Most of you will know we talk about the iris in our eye quite a lot and the iris is what controls the size of the pupil in the middle of the eye. So I'm, I'm pointing at my eye, but you probably can't see it properly. But the, the iris is what controls the size of the pupil. Um, uh, the pupil, you kind of already know what the pupil is. Um, cornea. So the cornea, uh, lets light into the eye and the curved surface of the cornea, so the cornea rests on top um, of the pupil here. So it lets light into the eye and it has a curved surface. So it helps to change the direction of the light so that the lens can make the final changes before it hits the retina. We're going to talk more about this, so don't worry if it, makes, if it doesn't quite make sense yet, but you need to know that as light comes towards the eye, the cornea bends that light a little bit and then the lens fine tunes it and then those light rays hit the receptor cells um, on the retina at the back of the eye. Okay and then finally, so after those light rays have hit those receptor cells in the retina, an image is formed and that image is sent to the brain via the optic nerve. So the optic nerve connects the eye to the brain. OK, 
Okay. Uh, there's a little note on this diagram that says there's a blind spot where the optic nerve leaves the eye, which there is because you can see there's a little gap in the retina there. But our brains are very clever and they make up for that. So you, it's not like when you're looking at something, you think, oh, there's a blind spot there. Our brains fill in that, um, that little gap there. Okay, quite a lot of information to take in there. Um, but we are going to go over it again and again. So don't worry if some of that didn't make sense. We can always come back later. I'll stop in a couple of slides. Time. For now, we're going to run through that process again of what happens when light enters the eye. Lots of writing on this slide. I've written it out in full because I know some of you really like to take notes. Um, but you absolutely don't have to write down all of this. I'm going to run through it quickly. Um, and most of it you can see in these diagrams. So don't worry about reading every word. Um, so first thing that happens when light is entering the eye is that the light goes through the cornea, which we talked about. So now the cornea is in front of the pupil there. The curved surface of the cornea, at the front of the eye, when you look at our eyes, they have that curving over the pupil, don't they? And that is the cornea. Um, so the curved surface helps to change the direction of the light um, and direct it towards the retina. So if you think of light rays, uh, they're coming towards us all the time, light rays, but they're coming, depending on um, what's reflecting that light, they can be coming at lots of different angles. So our eyes are really clever in that they kind of consolidate that and make sure that they all go in the right direction to the retina at the back of the eye. Okay, the second point, note, is that the muscles around the iris controls the size of the pupil. Again, we talked about this in the last slide, so you could see it um, uh, in kind of a sideways view there. Um, the pupil is the hole where the light enters the eye and the iris around that controls the size of it. And there's a good diagram here about what happens in bright light or in dim light. So the muscles around the iris contract in bright light. So less light enters the pupil. Um, and this is to stop us letting too much light in and damaging those receptor cells. So if the light's too strong, you know when you look at the sun and then you see black spots, that's because um, the light is so bright that it's inflicting damage on your eyes. That's why you shouldn't look at the sun. Um, alternatively, when light is dim, we're looking to get as many light rays into our eyes as possible because we want to see. Um, some people are better at seeing in the dark than others and that's because they happen to have slightly better um, receptors in their eyes. So in dim light, the muscles contract to let in lots of light. The type of muscle depends a little bit. So you can see in the diagram, you've got radial muscles when your pupil is dilating and becoming bigger and circular muscles that contract when the pupil needs to be smaller in dim light, uh, bright light. <laughs> okay, so dim light, radial muscles contract, the pupil gets bigger to allow in more light. In bright light, the circular muscles contract and the pupil gets smaller so that less light goes in. Okay. Let's move on to point three here. So having gone through the cornea um, and through a pupil that's whatever size is appropriate to the dimness or the brightness of the light that's going in, our light rays now hit the lens. We've talked about the lens and we said that it fine tunes the focus of the light. So the corneas kind of roughly change the direction. So it's going pretty much towards the retina. But the lens is what focuses, allows it to hit the back um, of the eye, hit those receptor cells at exactly the right angle to generate a really sharp image. 
So the lens fine tunes the focus of the light, changing the direction even more to produce a clear image on the retina. And um, the lens is moved by the ciliary muscles. So it's the movement of the lens that causes that, um, that refraction of light. So the refraction of light is the change of direction in the light um, that causes you to have that really nice clear image that you can see. And the lens is moved by the ciliary muscles and the suspensory ligaments that we talked about on the previous slide. So hopefully this is kind of all fitting in now. Um, and then I've put a little note there that light is focused by refraction, which basically just means the changing of direction of light. And it's mainly done by the lens. But as we said, there was some done by the cornea as well when the light first got to the eye. Okay, and then finally, light sensitive receptor cells are stimulated and send <laughs> impulses along the optic nerve to the brain. Okay, simple enough. There's a slight um, other thing to remember here in that the image is upside down on the back of the eye. So if you look at how, uh, if you look at this diagram here, we've got the snake that we've seen and the snake's head is at the top. Uh, the light that's reflecting off the snake and that goes um, into our eyes is altered by um, the cornea and then by the lens. But you see the lens there, when it's focusing the light, focuses it down to the bottom of the back of the eye. So do you see what I mean? It's upside down. But our brains are really clever and it knows that the image on the back of our eye is upside down. So our brains automatically translate that image so that it's the right way up, which is very cool. Okay, um, I'm going to leave all of that there. The lesson scheduler, unfortunately, is slightly in the way. So let me know if you need to move it. Um, and I'm just going to answer any questions that you have, because I know some of you will be making notes. We'll give you a bit of time. Okay. A few questions here, so I'll just work through them. Uh, there's a couple in the chat, so I'll do this first. Um, what controls the colour of your eye? That's a really good question, Olivia. So the colour of your eye is controlled by your genes. That's what determines the colours of your eye. Um, we haven't talked about, oh, excuse me. We haven't talked about um, genetics in detail yet. We are going to. Um, so in genetics, there are two different um, alleles of the same gene that uh, control the colour of the eye. And depending on what kind of alleles for that gene that you've got from your parents, um, depends on the colour of your eyes, basically, or results in the colour of your eyes. So I have kind of, I have that sort of mixed colour of eyes that's not quite green or brown or grey or blue. Um, but the blue eyes here that you can see in the diagram and other people have brown eyes and it all depends on the eye colour of your parents really. Does the image you're looking at form on the retina at the back of the eye? Yes it does. We are doing a Kahoot quiz today. We've got a little bit more to do first. Okay, um, someone's saying that they've got friends that have different eye colors to both of their parents. So um, that's explained by, um, so this is hard to explain quickly, <laughs> but different alleles for different genes have different strengths. So you can have dominant or recessive alleles. Um, and because you inherit an allele from each of your parents, you can have them in different combinations. Um, and different combinations relate to 
um, different eye colours. So it's quite possible that um, both of your parents would have had dominant um, eye colour genes that made their eyes one colour, but that um, their child would have inherited uh, the two recessive alleles, so the not as dominant, so they'd have an eye colour determined by those and not overall by a dominant allele. This is a very quick explanation. We will go over this in more detail and you will cover it um, in, in your biology GCSE at some point. So don't worry if you don't understand that. Um, it's not really to do with the amount of melanin in your eye, actually. So um, it is more to do with genetics. Um, so it's not like you can have a variable amount of melanin in your eye. It is controlled by genetics. Okay. Um, more questions? Okay, um, some of you saying that you can't see messages in the chat. So in the chat, um, you can change who you're sending messages to. So at the moment you're sending messages to all panelists. You can change that to all are panelists and attendees. If you want others to be able to see the questions that you're asking. Uh, there's no required practical for this session. Um, some are quite correctly pointing out that in dim light, do the muscles contract or dilate? Um, so you can see that it's different types of muscles that contract too. So in, in dim light and bright light, muscles contract, but it's different types of muscles. And I will just move this up because I can see that some of you are wanting to, to copy out that part by number five. Uh, okay, right. Those of you in the chat are saying that it doesn't let you, it should do now. So you should be able to ask questions to everyone now. Okay. And is blue eyes a mutation? No, blue eyes isn't a mutation. Blue eyes is, um, I'm pretty sure it's a result of two recessive alleles, blue eyes, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, you're right, having um, very blue eyes is less common, and that's usually because it's recessive alleles that control whether you have blue eyes or not. And so I'm pretty sure, but I'm not 100% sure. Okay, let's move on to the next couple of slides. So we've established what happens when light hits the eye. But... If you look in front of you now, there'll be some objects that are nearby, presumably the screen, and then there'll be other objects that are further away. Um, so for me, I'm looking outside and I can see a table and chairs. I can see both of those things at once. Admittedly, one is always blurry. You can't see both clearly at once, but your brain can switch between them very, very quickly. And your eye enables that. And this being able to switch between seeing near and far and being able to see both at once to some extent is called accommodation. Well, that's a key word there. So accommodation is how we see both near and far. We've said that the cornea refracts light towards the retina, so it changes the direction of those light waves towards the retina. And the lens changes, uh, changes shape by accommodation to focus that light so that you can see both near and far objects. We've talked about how the cornea and the lens both focus the light, but now we're gonna learn about 
more of what the lens does in order to cope with distant and near objects. Okay, so we're going to do distant first. You can see the diagram here. So for distant objects, light is traveling generally in parallel rays. So it's far enough away that the light is coming in parallel towards your eye. Remember we talked about the ciliary muscles and the suspensory ligaments that um, kind of keep the lens in place and alter its direction and its shape. Well, this is when they come into play. So when something is distant and the light rays are traveling in parallel, the ciliary muscles relax, which means that the suspensory ligaments are pulled tight. So it's kind of the opposite there. Ciliaries relax, suspensory ligaments tighten. This means that the lens is very flat and thin so that light is only reflected, slight, refracted slightly onto the retina. So light is coming in parallel rays, it's heading straight into the eye, it's heading straight for the back of the eye. So we don't want to change the direction of it too much. So we keep that lens pulled nice and thin um, and the light just goes straight through in general. It's changed slightly. And that allows us to see that distant object. For near objects, it's the reverse. So when objects are near, the light rays that are reflecting off that object are um, spread out more, they're spreading out more. So the lens needs to change the direction of those light rays even more to make sure that it hits those receptor cells on the retina at the back of the eye. So, in order to do that, the ciliary muscles contract and the suspensory ligaments loosen this time. So it's the opposite. This means that the lens is thicker and more curved. And that means that the light changes direction even more. Okay, because it hits the lens and then it bounces back down to the bottom of the retina. Okay, so distant objects, ciliary muscles relax. Suspensory ligaments do the opposite of what the ciliary muscles do, so they go tight. Lens is flat and thin. For near objects, we need to change the direction of the light more, so we need that lens to be much thicker and more curved. So to do that, we need the ciliary muscles to contract and suspensory ligaments to loosen, okay? So if it's near, ciliary muscles contract. If it's far, ciliary muscles relax. If it's far away, it's a long distance away, the ciliary muscles are longer, they're relaxed. That's the way I would remember it. Okay. So, what happens when you have a slight problem with how the lens focuses those images? So we all know people that wear glasses. Some of you might um, wear glasses yourselves and to be honest, you guys are probably the experts on this. Um, so we're gonna talk about long-sightedness and short-sightedness, why they happen and what we can do about them. So uh, let's talk about short-sightedness first. I'm gonna just move this up so you can see this diagram properly. So short-sightedness is called myopia. Um, and when you're short-sighted, you can see close objects quite well, but your eyes really struggle to focus properly on objects that are further away. Um, when you're short-sighted, the light is being focused slightly in front of the retina. So you can see um, in this diagram here, that for short-sightedness, 
the image is just slightly in front of the retina. We would want it to be right on it, but it's slightly in front. Um, this is generally because the lens is too curved. So either the lens is naturally quite curved or those, the ciliary muscles and the suspensory ligaments aren't quite working as they should and they're keeping that lens a bit more curved than you'd want it to be. So it's reflecting that light or refracting, changing the direction of that light even more. So it's hitting just in front of the retina rather than straight on it. Sometimes it's also caused because the eyeball is slightly long as well. In order to correct this, you can wear glasses with a concaved lens. So concaved means that goes in like a cave. That's how I remember it. And that concave lens spreads out the light from distant objects before it hits the eye. So the eye is better at, um, at changing the direction of the light so that um, the glasses make it so that the eye needs to change the direction of the light more. So it adjusts the light rays that are coming in. Okay, so myopia, short-sightedness. You can see close objects well, but distant objects are blurry. So you need a concave lens in order to spread out those rays of light so that the curved lens inside the eye <laughs> can change the direction of that light and focus it properly. When you're answering questions about this in exams, be very careful to make sure that um, the examiner knows wh which lens you're talking about. Because of course, um, in typical confusing ways, we call glasses lenses, lenses, but also the part of our eye that normally focuses the light is also called a lens. So make sure that um, you're very clear about which one you're talking about. Okay. Um, hyperopia is long sightedness um, and is the opposite. So distant objects are in focus, really good at allowing those parallel lay rays to come into the eye, not having to change the direction of the light much and focusing that image on the retina. But close objects are blurred. So in this case, the eye is really struggling to, when it has to change the direction of the light a lot. Um, it does this because the lens in the eye is a bit too flat and thin or the eyeball is slightly short. So the opposite of myopia. So you can see on long sightedness, um, you have a much thinner lens. The light is focused behind the retina instead of in front of it. So it's just gone a bit long. And in order to correct it, we wear glasses with a convex lens. So convex is when it goes upwards. This brings the light closer together before it gets to the eye. And then the lens in the eye, which is slightly too thin, can um, focus that and refract that light to the best of its abilities and get it right on the back of the retina. Okay. So that's long sightedness and short sightedness. I appreciate there's lots of kind of steps to remember this lesson. I'm gonna give you a second just to write that down. Here's about 30 of us here today. Um, I think it was Olivia that asked that one. We're going to talk about len uh, contact lenses on the next slide, so I'll leave that one for now. Great that a couple of you, um, Cameron and Zayuma, have said that they're short sighted. Um, so, you guys, definitely the experts on this, you'll know firsthand what it's like um, that you can see objects that are quite close, but distant objects are difficult. So I don't know whether either of you wear glasses, um, you might wear contacts, but those will have the concave lens in order to spread out the light from those distant objects before it hits the eye. And that means that the lenses within your eye um, are capable of focusing that light onto the retina. 
And is myopia and hyperopia hereditary? That's a really good question. Um, and to be honest, I'm not sure. I think it's a combination of um, it is hereditary, but it can also be influenced by other factors as well. So to some extent, yes, um, the quality of your eyesight is hereditary, but I think there's other things that influence it as well, which is why when we're growing up, um, we have to go for eye tests um, when we're little more regularly than you would once, um, once we're adults, to so kind of monitor the development of the eye closely so that if there are any problems, they can be sorted out. Uh, another question, can you wear glasses if your parents do? Uh, it depends on whether you need to or not. Um, if your eyesight isn't perhaps as good as it could be, then you might wear glasses, um, but it, it does depend. Okay, other people ask you about purple eyes. As far as I'm aware, purple eyes don't occur naturally. But again, that's as far as I'm aware. Um, you can get purple contact lenses. You can get contact lenses that alter the color of your eyes. Um, but apart, I don't think you would ever be born with purple eyes. I'm watching Game of Thrones. <laughs> A couple of other questions about whether um, being long-sighted or short-sighted is related to kind of where you are geographically. Um, as far as I know, it's not, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Okay, quite a few questions about contact lenses coming in. So let's talk about contact lenses. So we've talked about glasses and how they can overcome eye problems, but since technology has moved forward, there are other things that you can do as well if you're long-sighted or short-sighted or have other problems in eyes. So we haven't really talked about things like cataracts, which are when um, a cloud comes over your cornea. Um, I, I, that's usually something that happens um, when people are elderly, but it can be caused by other things too. Um, and there are other problems as well, but that's just another example. So contact lenses are something that quite a few of you have pointed out that you wear and they are often used now instead of glasses. A lot of people feel that they look better. Some people find them more comfortable and it's very much an individual thing. So contact lenses, they do the same job as glasses, but they can't be seen. So if you're short sighted or near sighted, your contact lenses will be slightly different shapes. And you know, um, if you've ever been and had to get glasses, you can get different kind of variations. They're normally described by numbers for how concave or convex your lens needs to be. So that's pretty cool. We've got the kind of capabilities now to adjust those exactly. Um, so that when you're wearing those contact lenses or those glasses, you have a really, really sharply defined picture. Um, so you can have different types of contact lenses so you can get hard contact lenses that are really durable last a really long time but they need to be removed every night and kept in um, sterile solution to make sure that when you put them back in they don't become infected um, and you can also get soft contact lenses which is probably the ones that you've seen more with friends um, or that you might wear yourself they don't tend to last quite as long but they do tend to be a bit more comfortable just because they're softer, so they tend to mold to the eye a bit easier. Um, generally, you might have heard them described as monthlies or dailies. Um, so you can have monthly ones that you change every month. Oh dear, lots of ringing today. Sorry, everyone. Um, so you can have monthly contact lenses. They last a month and then you get another set. Or you can have daily ones that you um, 
use for one day and then you move on again. Okay, so that's how contact lenses work. I think that's answered everyone's questions about contact lenses. Richard's saying that he's been wearing them for five years now. Um, hard contact lenses during the night and without anything during the day. Um, hard contact lenses can be slightly damaging to the eyes if you like stumble when you put them in. That's because they're harder, they're slightly more likely to kind of scratch your eye a little bit. And that's not necessarily that serious. You just get kind of good at it after a while. Um, but in general, no, they don't damage, don't damage eyes. The softer ones are a bit less likely to do that. But like I say, you, you know, when you're popping things in and out of your eye, you do have to be careful to make sure that they're sterile um, and just be careful. Okay, next thing is laser eye surgery. So laser eye surgery can only happen once the eyes are fully developed. So only for adults. Um, I'm not sure when eyes become fully developed. I don't know what stage during growing up they stop changing. But laser eye surgery is certainly only considered if you're over 18. Um, laser eye surgery tends to work on the cornea, so it reduces the thickness of the cornea, which means that the light is reflect, refracted less strongly to treat myopia or they change the curve of the cornea for hyperopia. So they make it more curved for hyperopia. So laser eye surgery, surgery is a permanent change. Um, it comes with its own risks, it is surgery. Um, the technology for it has developed a lot more over the last few years. It's, it's very accurate, a lot of people have it done. It is quite costly, that's the other thing. Um, so that's another option. And then finally, replacement lenses. And by replacement lenses here, I mean the lens inside your eye. So this is even more involved surgery than laser eye surgery. So replacement lens is adding another lens into the eye itself. So there's two ways you can do this. One involves a permanent contact lens over the existing lens. So it's like putting a cover on, over it to kind of change its shape so it either becomes more curved or less curved as needed depending on whether you're short-sighted or long-sighted or you can replace the lens entirely and put an artificial one in there instead um, so this diagram here which is um, it kind of demonstrates cataract surgery but it's the same procedure of putting in a different lens so the eye with the cataract um, you can see the cloud there so the disease lens is pulled out, um, or it's not necessarily diseased, it might just be not functioning properly and be the right shape. Uh, then the implant of the lens, so the replacement lens is inserted and kept there. And that again is another permanent change. It needs to be monitored like everything, um, but it is a permanent change. There is risk of damage to the rest of the eye while that surgery is taking place. It's usually minor and you normally recover perfectly well. But obviously, as with any surgery, there are risks involved. So something to consider, um, but you would take advice from, from doctors on this as you would with any surgery. Okay, so that's three methods of overcoming those eye problems aside from glasses. Have a look for any more questions. Saima has pulled up a YouTube video. Um, oh, which we can see here, but we probably won't have time to watch it now. So what I'll do is I will copy it into the chat for you. Oh, here we go. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'll put that in the chat so that everyone can see. Here we go. 
Um, someone's saying it looks really painful. It is really painful, um, but obviously, you know, it's done with pain, um, pain treatment if needed. Can your eye color change while your eyes grow? That's a really good question, Soma. So they do change slightly um, from when you're a baby. So often babies are born with blue eyes and then they change gradually and that comes with the development. Um, surgery, a lot of people are asking about the pain there. There's a couple of questions. So surgery is normally done with, with pain control, um, obviously. And then um, any pain that you had afterwards would also you'd be given pain meds for. Um, but so, you know, people don't come out saying, oh my gosh, that was so painful. You know, it's all controlled as with any surgery. Okay, and another question there about eye transplants. Um, I don't know much about eye transplants. Um, I think they can be done, but I don't know exactly how. Uh, is it bad to wear colour contacts at a young age as your eyes are still growing? Um, no, provided they're prescribed con contact lenses. So if at a young age um, you're becoming short-sighted or you have become short-sighted, then obviously, you know, um, taking advice from your opticians, you would want to correct that. And so you need to wear glasses or contact lenses as needed. Um, and you go back for regular opticians appointments and they'll advise you if anything changes. So you don't need to be worried um, about wearing them when you're young. You know, your sight needs to be needs to be good. You need to be able to read and you need to be able to, you know, be outside and to play and to do all of those things. So um, definitely need to wear them if you're advised to. Another good question from Catherine, do pupils grow or is it just your outer eye? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how different parts of the eye grow and at what speed in relation to each other. Something to look up. Okay, I've got 10 minutes left. So let's go on and do a quiz. So I've just written a quick slide here to say thank you for those that have come um, every lesson for the last few weeks. Um, thank you very much um, and I hope you'll keep coming on Mondays at two o'clock for the next few sessions if you're not at school. I know it's different for all of you. I know some of you are going into A-level, some of you aren't quite going into GCSE yet, some of you are year 10, some 11. So um, lots of differences there but if you can make it we are doing sessions on Monday two to three from now on. There's also small group sessions being run by my tutor as well um, so look out for those. And if you do want one-to-one -one tutoring, a few of you have asked about that. Um, I have got the link to my profile now as well. So, um, there's the link there. And what I will do is I will put it in the chat as well. Then you'll be able to see it there. Any second now, it should appear. Okay, so that is the link to my profile. There are a couple of people saying that you've sent me messages. I haven't received any, so that might well have been for a different Charlotte. So definitely pop those there. I'm more than happy to help um, with one-to-one -one tutoring where I can. But also remember there's lots and lots of other tutors on the My Tutor website as well, lots of other biology tutors. So feel free to have a look round. Um, don't worry if you don't message me, I won't mind if you find someone else that you think suits you better. But by all means, send me a message and I can put word out as well if you'd like to find someone. So go for it if it suits. Um, now we have a quiz. Okay, so we have a Kahoot quiz this time. So I'm going to put this up. Um, you don't need to um, join in on Kahoot if you don't want to. You can play on the chat and I will keep an eye on that too. 
So if you haven't used Kahoot before, it's really easy. It will tell you what to do. Um, it's logged me out. That's really annoying. Give me five seconds, I'm just going to log in. Any second now, it is logging me in. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Oh, let's turn that down. <laughs> okay, so go to www.kahoot.it or you can use the Kahoot app if you've used it before and type in 211791 um, and then you'll see yourself appear at the bottom. Okay. It will give you its own names. <laughs> um, so I'm afraid I don't think you can choose. Oh, a couple of people saying that the screen is frozen. A few have joined, so it's not frozen for everyone. Okay, you should be able to see it now. Okay, and I'm going to say the pin again. It's 211791. Oh, I see. Okay. If it has frozen, then um, go to www.kahoot.it and the game pin is 211791. We're going to play quickly um, before the end of the session. 14 people in. Okay, good. Okay, I'm hoping that most of you have been able to join or can now see the screen. So I think we're going to start. We've only got a couple of minutes left. So 12 questions, I'll read them out as well. Which of the following is not part of the eye? This is question one. You have 25 seconds. Your options are iris, cornea, retina, or papillae, which is not part of the eye. 16 seconds left. Click those if you can see. If you want to play on the chat, then that's fine. 
send me answers over the chat if you would like to. Um, you just need to click the so that it just goes to panelists. Nice. 50, 15 of you all answered that correct. So well done, purple unicorn who got the fastest. Um, so that's the top five that you can see there. Okay, question two. What is the part of the eye indicated by the arrow? You can see the arrow on the screen. 23 seconds. Your choices are lens, iris, stapes, or retina. Which is the part of the eye indicated by the arrow? The screen is still frozen for you. I'm sorry that you can't see it. We should be okay now. One second. 15 answers. Well done, everyone that said lens. That was the correct answer. A few people saying iris um, and a couple of people saying retina. Leaderboard. Oh, purple unicorn still on the top. Glowing tiger. It's gone up a little bit there. Well done, whoever glowing tiger. Question three. The part of the eye that takes signals to the brain is called the retina, pupil, cornea, or optic nerve. Answers as quick as you can. 20 seconds left. The part of the eye that takes signals to the brain is called retina, cornea, pupil, or optic nerve. Okay, well done everyone that put optic nerve. That's the correct answer. Okay, how's the leaderboard changed? Purple tiger still on the top. Glowing tiger now. So in second place, amiable emu in third, radiant shark in fourth, and soaring impala in fifth place. Question four, what refracts light to focus a real image on the back of the eye? Your options are sclera, iris, lens, retina. What refracts light to focus a real image on the back of the eye? Sclera, lens, iris, or retina. <laughs> well done, those who noticed that the picture says the answer. <laughs> it was lens. Well done. Radiant shark. It's overtaken purple unicorn on the leaderboard. Well done. Top spot. Question five, what's the ability of the eye to adjust to variations in distance called? Is it accommodation, focal length, astigmatism, or hyperopia? The ability of the eye to adjust to variations in distance. Okay. Five seconds. Well done, everyone. Yes, well done all those who said accommodation. So accommodation is what it's called when your eye adjusts to be able to see near and far. Oh, purple unicorn back on the top. Jolly lemur in second place. Well done. Question six. If a person is nearsighted, what happens to the image? If you're nearsighted. Your options are, eyeball is long, image, image focuses in front of the retina. Eyeball is short, image focuses behind the retina. Eyeball is short, image focuses in front of the retina. Or eyeball is long and image focuses behind the retina. Giving you a bit more time for this one because there's lots to read. If you're nearsighted, where is the image focused in the eye? And is the eyeball long or short? 15 ounces already. Well done. Mm -hmm. 
The image is slightly blurry. Does make your eyes funny. Okay, five seconds for anyone who hasn't answered yet. Okay, well done all of those who said that the eyeball is long and the image focuses in front of the retina. So we did say when we were talking about myopia and hyperopia that um, it's because of the shaping of the lens in the eye, but also because the eyeball might be slightly long or short. Um, and in the case of being nearsighted, the eyeball is slightly long usually. So well done those who remembered that one. But the image does focus in front of the retina and you pretty much all remembered that, so well done. Purple unicorn stood at the top with Jolly Lemur in second place. Clever octopus now in third. Well done. Question seven. How do we focus on distant objects? It says two right answers here and you can click either. How do we focus on distant objects? Ciliary muscles relax, suspensory ligaments tighten. Ciliary muscles contract, suspensory ligaments loosen. Lens becomes a more rounded shape, so light is reflected more. Lens becomes a less rounded shape and light is reflected less. So move my face so it's not in the way. Okay, I've given lots of time here. Oh no, but I've clicked on the wrong one by accident. Okay, 10 seconds left. So remember what the muscles do and what the lens does when you're focusing on a distant object. Okay, well done, those who picked red. You were correct. Um, so the ciliary muscle relaxes. Remember, distant, so the muscle is longer, it's relaxed, which means that the suspensory ligaments do the opposite, so they tighten. Um, and for distant objects, the lens becomes a less rounded shape, so light is refracted less, because for distant objects, the light is coming in parallel rays, you don't need to change the direction of it so much. Well done. Soaring Impala is on a roll at the moment into third place. Eight of 12. What's the definition of myopia? <laughs> My eyes burn, but I don't see anything. People can see far objects clearly, but objects closer appear blurry. People can see objects, close objects clearly, but objects further away appear blurry or nothing is seen. Myopia. Five seconds left. Okay. Nice one. Everyone that picked yellow. Short sightedness. I am aware that it's now five past three. If you need to go, don't worry. That's fine. Um, and hopefully, I will see you on Monday. We will just finish the quiz. Question nine, a person with hyperopia cannot see nearby objects well, cannot see far away objects well, cannot see colors or has perfect vision. We won't be long, by the way. <laughs> Getting competitive here. Okay, well done everyone who put cannot see nearby objects well. So hyperopia is being farsighted. No change there. Purple unicorn at the top, then sorry impala, and then jolly lemur. Amiable emu doing well into fourth place. 10 of 12. Hyperopia or farsightedness occurs when Light rays focus in front of the retina, light rays focus behind the retina, light rays focus to the side of the retina, or light rays focus on the retina. What's far sightedness? Five seconds. OK, 
Okay, very good. Light rays focus behind the retina. Well done. We go, purple unicorn still at the top. Okay, question 11 of 12. What type of lens would a person need to help correct nearsightedness? Do they need a concave lens, a convex lens, prism or glasses? This is the best answer. What type of lens would a person need to help correct nearsightedness? Five seconds. Pick your answers. Oh, all 17 of you have answered. Well done. Okay, well done everyone that put concave lens. You need a concave lens when you're nearsighted so that you can refract the light even more. So a really curved lens. Clever Octopus moved up there. It's a definite contest between Clever Octopus and Amiable Emu in fourth and fifth there. Last question. Which of these is a medical intervention for far sightedness? Corneal transplant, concave lenses, convex lenses, or all of these? Far sightedness. Convex lenses, well done for that. Okay, final results. In third, Soaring Impala. In second, Jolly Lima. And in first, well done Purple Unicorn. Strong performance there from Purple Unicorn. And in fourth and fifth, Clever Octopus and Amiable Emu, who were juggling for position the whole way through. Well done, everyone. Well done, Ty. Okay. Well done, everyone. I'm just scrolling through the chat, there are loads of those. <laughs> okay. Um, so as I said, uh, if you can't join us on Monday at two to three, make sure you have a look at the other options through the MyTutor website. Um, and if you'd like to talk about tutoring or think about one-to-one -one tutoring, then have a look at the profile link that I popped in the chat there. If you, you can copy and paste that and save it if you need to. Um, otherwise, I hope to see as many of you as possible, as many of you as possible on Monday. If you're going back to school, then good luck. I'm sure it'd be really nice to see your friends and your teachers, um, even if it will be a bit different. And have a lovely weekend. Okay. Perfect. Bye, everyone.